Hello students. <clears throat> We're about to begin our section on the cardiovascular system, which is quite a lengthy section as far as the course is concerned, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, but it is a very important organ system. So we're going to have three different lectures on the cardiovascular system. Lecture number one, the heart, is about the heart itself. Lecture number two will be about the important blood vessels, ma the major veins and the major arteries and the in the human body. And lecture three will be about the blood itself, because the blood by itself is quite an important uh, component of the cardiovascular system. It's not trivial. So we'll start now with taking a look at the heart. And what I'm going to discuss is I will first discuss the anatomy of the heart, the different chambers, different chambers, the different compartments of the heart, as well as the valves, and also the great vessels. The great vessels are the large blood vessels like the aorta and the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava that, that uh, make direct contact with the heart. These the great meaning they're large. And then we'll discuss a little bit about heart physiology, uh, the pulse rate, beats per minute, the heart rate or the pulse. Uh, we will talk about the cardiac output. This is how much, uh, how much blood does each ventricle of the heart uh, put out, send out into the body every, every minute. Uh, it, it's obviously related to the number of beats per minute. And we will discuss how to measure an electrocardiogram. Uh, this is where you put electrodes on the chest, and because the heart is a muscle, and we mentioned and we learned during the neurology section that uh, muscles, uh, neuron, muscles are controlled by neurons, and when neurons discharge, when neurons fire, they incidentally generate some electricity. The, the, the electrical signals are not actually transmitted throughout the body by electricity, but some electricity is generated in the process. So you can measure that electricity. And because the heart is a large muscle that has a lot of nerves associated with it, you can actually measure the discharge. You can measure the, the pumping of the heart using an electrical system where you put electrodes on either side of the chest. Uh, and then, of course, like all the other lectures, we'll, discover, we'll discuss some of the pathology of, this, of the organ system we're talking about. So we'll talk about different things that go wrong with the heart, including valve stenosis. That's basically stiffening of the valves. Valve prolapse is where uh, you have a heart valve that's made of two or more leaflets. If one of the leaflets kind of bends and, and swings in the wrong direction, the valve doesn't work the way it's supposed to anymore. That's called valve prolapse. Cardiac tamp uh, tamponade is where the, uh, the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart fills up with fluid, and so that will restrict the amount of room that the heart has to fill up with blood. That's a, a potentially lethal situation. Uh, we'll talk about coronary artery disease and septal defects. Uh, uh, septal, the word septal is, is a Latin word meaning wall. Right? So a septum means a wall. And if you have a hole in the wall, it's referred to as a septal defect. So we'll talk about several uh, septal defects that are considered to be congenital heart diseases where you're born with a hole in your heart. Okay, the first thing to learn is that the heart has actually has two different circuits that it sends blood to. One of them is where we, one of these circuits, a circuit of course is where you, uh, you go around and then you end up back where you started again, just like a racing circuit or an electrical circuit. You go around this course and you end up where you started from. Okay, so the pulmonary, what does the word pulmonary mean? You do need to know this. The word pulmonary refers to the lungs. And so there is one circuit called the pulmonic circuit where the heart sends blood from the, the heart to the lungs and back to the heart again. Obviously what's happening there is that the blood is getting re-oxygenated. So when the, when the blood travels around the body, its purpose is to deliver oxygen to all the organs. And so it becomes deoxygenated. It becomes oxygen depleted. And then it has to be re-energized again. It has to be resaturated with oxygen. So that's why we send it back to the heart. The heart sends it through the lungs and then back to the heart and then out to the body. So when the blood goes through the lungs to become oxygen enriched, it then ends up back in the heart and then the heart sends it out to the body. And that's referred to as the systemic circuit for the heart. So the heart is pumping blood to two different circuits the pulmonary circuit 
and the systemic circuit, these are considered to be separate circuits. Now, some of you that are taking Biology 110 or Biology 120 will realize that, that we've discussed the fact that other animals, there are some animals that don't have two separate circuits, they only have one. Many of the fish, for instance, they don't, uh, they don't have a separate uh, pumping system that pumps blood to the gills and back and then another circuit where the blood goes around the body. In a fish, the blood goes to the gills and around the body and back to the heart again in a single circuit. But humans have two circuits. In fact, all mammals have two circuits. Mammals, of course, humans are mammals. Any animals that feed milk to their young are considered mammals, and they all have basically the same internal organ structure. So we have a heart that's very similar to a cow's heart or to a, to a sheep's heart or to a tiger or a lion's heart, to a dog or a cat or a rat. Okay, so we'll take a look at these two circuits. Okay, now first of all, we need to understand where the heart is. The heart is located in a region called the mediastinum, right, which is within the thoracic cavity. And generally the top, the top of the heart, the top of the heart can be found at the level of the third rib. The bottom of the heart is referred to as the apex. Now that's a little weird, that's a little odd, it's kind of a misnomer because the word apex means at the top. And you've seen that you've seen pictures of hearts where it comes to a point at the bottom and this point at the bottom is sort of pointing at towards the left hand side of the thorax towards the left hand side of your chest and it's called the apex so it is actually the bottom but it's it's called the apex okay and then i i sorry i forgot to mention that the so the top of the heart is at the is at the third rib and the bottom of the heart is basically just above the xiphoid process right here, the xiphoid process of the sternum. So here we have the mediastinum, right? So there's the third rib, right? There's the top of the heart. And then the bottom of the heart is just above, the apex of the heart is just above the xiphoid process of the sternum. And in fact, when you do CPR, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you put your fit, you put your hands on onto the person's chest and compress the chest to pump the blood around. You've probably seen that done on television. Uh, uh, on television shows, medical shows, and so on. And obviously, uh, nobody is. Re it, it, it's not recommended that anybody try that unless you've been trained how to do it. Because if you don't do it properly, you could end up doing more damage than good. Uh, but but if somebody is having a heart attack, if their heart stops, if they have cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest literally means the the heart stops. You can do CPR until medical people arrive. And so what you do is you put your two hands on the person's chest and you position your thumbs so that you can feel the xiphoid process of the sternum and then you know that your hands are sitting right on top of the heart when you compress it to pump the blood around. So here we have CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Right? So you, you put your two, your two hands on the mediastinum and you position your thumbs so that you can feel the xiphoid process of the sternum and then you push downward to compress the heart. Uh, and that is something that you should be trained to do. You shouldn't do it just, just uh, based on this diagram or th seeing things on television, for instance. All right, so I mentioned that we have two circuits. We have the pulmonary circuit, which sends blood to the, to the lungs, and we have the systemic circuit, which sends blood out to the body. All right, as it happens, the right side of the heart is, is where the blood goes when it is oxygen depleted. So when the, when the blood returns to the heart from the systemic circuit, it ends up in the right side of the heart. It ends up in the right side of the heart. So the oxygen depleted blood ends up in the right side of the heart. And the right side of the heart sends the blood to the lungs. Right, so the right side of the heart is sending the blood to the lungs to be reoxygenated. Once the blood is oxygen reox uh, the blood is oxygen reoxygenate reoxygenated, it's recharged, it gets sent, and it ends up in in the left side of the heart. And so the left side of the heart receives the oxygen enriched blood, and then the left side of the heart sends it out to the body. So the left side of the heart sends the blood out to the systemic circuit. 
right? So, and then when it returns from the, when the oxygen depleted blood returns from the systemic circuit, it ends up again in the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart sends the blood to the pulmonary circuit, to the lungs. And then after traveling through the lungs, it ends up back at the left side of the heart. And from the left side of the heart, it gets sent out to the body and then back again. Okay, so on anatomy diagrams, veins, which usually but not always carry oxygen depleted blood. Oxygen depleted blood has a darker color to it. It has a more bluish color. It's not technically blue, but, but it has a more bluish color to it. It appears darker than the oxygen enriched blood. The oxygen enriched blood appears bright red. You know that when you cut yourself, the blood comes out of the, comes out of the body appearing bright red. And it doesn't matter whether you cut a vein or an artery, it always comes out red. And the reason for that, you know, you, you've never, I'm, I'm gambling, I'm, I'm assuming that you've never cut yourself and seen blue blood come out. And the reason for that is because it's the oxygen that gives the blood its red color. When oxygen attaches itself to the hemoglobin molecule, it causes the hemoglobin, it causes the heme group to turn red. When oxygen detaches and it comes off of the hemoglobin, it, it, it appears blue. So it's actually the oxygen that makes the blood appear red. It's the, it's the presence of the oxygen that makes the blood appear red. So even if the blood is oxygen depleted, if you cut it open, if you cut open a vein and you let the oxygen depleted blood make contact with the air, it's gonna pick up the oxygen and it will appear red. So that's why you've never cut yourself and seen blue blood come out. That's because it's only blue when it's being carried by a vein and, and it, it doesn't have any access to oxygen. All right, so I've drawn it like this, colored these two words because the right side of the heart is receiving the oxygen depleted blood, which is kind of a bluish color. And then the right, sorry, the left side of the heart is receiving the freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs and it's bright red. So this is a simplified diagram that shows the fact that the oxygen, the blue oxygen depleted blood ends up in the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart sends it out to the to the to the pulmonary circuit. After it's picked up some oxygen, it ends up back in the right. In, sorry, in the left side of the heart, and then the left side of the heart sends it out to the body, and then back again. These little web structures, by the way, are meant to illustrate capillaries, and capillaries are the special blood vessels that are made to that that are are there to deliver oxygen to the blood to the from the blood to the organs. So capillaries have very thin walls. They're made of a single layer of squamous cell epithelium. We call it endothelium, of course, because it's on the inside of a blood vessel. And so these capillaries have very thin walls that allow oxygen to go from the blood into the organs and carbon dioxide to come from the organs back into the blood so it can travel back to the, to the lungs. Okay, so we know that we have two circuits. We have a pulmonary circuit and a systemic circuit, but we have two lungs, right? So in fact, the, the pulmonary circuit is divided in two. There is a left and a right pulmonary circuit that send blood to the left and right lungs, not to the left and right chambers of the heart, but to the left and right lungs. So the pulmonary circuit has a left and right piece to it. Next, the systemic circuit is also divided in two. And some of the arteries that take blood away from the heart run upwards to the upper body and they, and they deliver blood to the head and the arms. And some of them uh, of the arteries go downwards and deliver blood to the lower part of the body, to the abdomen and the legs and the, and the visceral organs in the abdomen. So this diagram is more accurate than the last one I showed you because it actually shows that there are two systemic circuits and there are two pulmonary circuits. So there are there are two pul uh, two pulmonary circuits, a left and a right pulmonary circuit, and then there are two systemic circuits, an upper one and a lower one. All right, let's look at the anatomy of the heart itself. The heart is divided up into four little compartments, four chambers. The two chambers on the top are referred to as the atria. The two chambers on the bottom are referred to as the ventricles. The atria and the ventricles are separated by valves, right? And then we have the great vessels which are attached to the heart, directly attached to the heart. The coronary vessels and the, the coronary arteries, I should have said arteries there, not vessels, but the coronary arteries and the cardiac veins take blood to and from the heart directly, right? So the heart is a muscle. 
So the, the, like any muscle, it needs a blood supply. So the coronary arteries take blood directly to the heart muscle. The cardiac veins take, uh, take blood away from the, from the heart. And then we'll talk a little bit about the layers of tissue that comprise the heart. Basically, the heart is a muscle, but, but the, but the uh, inner surface of the heart is actually simple squamous epithelium that we give a special name to. And the outside of the heart is actually the, uh, uh, the visceral layer of a serous membrane that we give a special name to. Okay, so the left side of the heart, it has an atrium, right? So the heart has, a, has left and right atria. That's the plural expression. So atrium is singular. The two atria are located at the top of the heart. They have relatively thin walls, and the, the walls between the, the walls are made of myocardium. Myocardium, you do need to know that word, of course. The word myocardium means muscle, uh, cardiac muscle. Myocardium refers to, to heart muscle. Uh, so the, the reason why I mentioned the fact that the atria have thin, there's a thin wall between dividing the left and the right atrium that's referred to as the atrial septum. It's thin because the septum, the, the wall, is made of myocardium, it's made of muscle, but we don't need a lot of muscle to pump the blood from the, from the heart to the lungs because it's a relatively short trip. And well, actually we do, I'm sorry, forget what I said. We don't need a lot of, we, we don't need, uh, pardon me, the atria, the atria's purpose is to pump blood to the ventricles. The ventricles are located beneath the atria, and it's a very short distance, so you don't need a lot of muscle tissue surrounding the atria because they, they are only pumping the blood a relatively short distance. Right, so below the two atria, we have a left and a right ventricle. Ventricles, plural. So the ventricles receive blood from the atria, and then they have very thick walls. They, they're surrounded by a thick layer of myocardium because they have to pump the blood very long distances. The right ventricle has to pump the blood all the way from the heart to the lungs and back. And then the left ventricle has to pump the blood all the way out to the body and back. So as you would imagine, the walls of the left ventricle are thicker than the walls of the right ventricle because the right ventricle only has to send the blood from the heart to the lungs. The left ventricle has to send the blood from the heart all the way out to the body. So the, the, generally speaking, the left atrium is slightly stronger than the right atrium because it's pumping blood a farther distance. Okay, so here you can see the structures. Here's the right atrium where the oxygen depleted blood ends up. From the oxygen, from the, uh, the right atrium, the blood is sent into the right ventricle. Right? And, and there's a valve that, that separates the two to make sure that the blood doesn't go in the wrong direction. So the, the valve has these little flaps of tissue that will close when the, when the ventricle contracts and prevent the blood from going that way, from going back up again into the atrium. If the blood goes in the wrong direction from the ventricle to the atrium, that's called regurgitation, regurgitation. Uh, regurgitation is a general word meaning to throw up, right? So when you vomit, that's also referred to as regurgitating your food because it's going in the wrong direction. So, so here we have the atria, right atrium, right ventricle. The blood is pumped from the right atrium into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it's pumped out to the, to the lungs. After it's had a trip through the lungs, it ends up back here in the left atrium. The left atrium pumps it into the left ventricle, and from the left ventricle, it gets, it gets shot out of a very strong artery called the aorta. So you can see that the, that, the atrial, that, that the atrial septum is relatively thin compared to the ventricular septum. So the word septum means wall, ventricular septum means the wall that separates the two ventricles. And the ventricular septum is quite thick because you need a lot of muscle surrounding the ventricles to push the blood over long distances. All right, so we have two atria and two ventricles. Those are the four chambers of the heart. Okay, so this is a better, this is a more realistic diagram, less schematic. This is demonstrating the direction of blood flow, just like the previous one. So blood flows into the into the right atrium from two of the great vessels. One of them is called the superior vena cava. The other one's called the inferior vena cava. It then flows out to the lungs through the left and right pulmonary arteries and then back through the left and right pulmonary veins. And we'll discuss all of this when we get to it.
Okay, so blood flows from the body into the right atrium, right? And then blood flows from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Then blood flows from the right ventricle into the lungs. And then it comes back from the lungs, it ends up in the left atrium. And then the blood is pumped, the newly oxygen enriched blood is pumped from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it gets pumped out into the body. So this is the circuit by which the blood flows throughout the body. Two, two circuits uh, to circulate blood all through the body. So this again is just a, this is just again a, illustrating the, the, the course of blood throughout the body. The blood arrives from the body into the right atrium, from the right atrium into the right ventricle, from the right ventricle into the lungs, from the lungs back into the left atrium, and then from the left atrium into the left ventricle, and then out to the body again. All right, now we have, there are four valves in the heart, which, as I said earlier, prevent the blood from flowing in the wrong direction. They have these little leaflets. These are kind of like little uh, flaps of tissue, connective tissue, that will, the flaps will be open if the blood is flowing in the right direction, but they will slam shut. They will close if the blood tries to go in the wrong direction. Right, and so these four, these of these four major valves in the heart, Two of them are separate are used to separate the atrium from the ventricle, and we have a left and a right, right? So, so the tricuspid valve is uh, so well. Just let me say, uh, the two valves that are used to separate the atria from the ventricles are, of course, referred to as the atrioventricular valves. And then there are two other valves which control blood flow in and out of the heart itself, basically, and those are referred to as the semilunar valves because somebody who first saw these valves thought that they looked like a half moon, which they absolutely don't. Uh, so I don't know where that name came from. It's a silly old obsolete name, but it, nevertheless, that's what, we, that's what everyone calls them, and so we have to learn that. So the two valves that separate Atria from ventricles are called atrioventricular valves, and they are the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. Now the tricuspid valve separates the right atrium from the right ventricle, and it is called a tricuspid valve because the little flaps of tissue that make up the valves are called cuspids, and how many of those flaps do you think there are in this valve? Right, tricuspid, of course, there are three Right, so the, 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 the tricuspid valve has three leaflets. They're called leaflets, actually, uh, or cusps. And, and it, separate, it, it separates the right atria from the right ventricle, prevents blood from regurgitating from the ventricle back up into the atria and, go, and traveling the wrong way. And the other atrioventricular valve is, is called the mitral valve. And how many leaflets or how many cusps cusps do you think it has? Has cuspids do you think it has? It is a bicuspid valve, so it has two. Uh, so it goes by two different names. So the, the, the uh, atrioventricular valve that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle has two names, the mitral valve and the bicuspid, uh, or the bicuspid valve. All right, what about these two semilunar valves? Okay, so the pulmonary semilunar valve is, it, it this is, as blood is leaving the heart, traveling towards the lungs, the pulmonary semilunar valve prevents the blood from flowing from the lungs back into the heart, traveling the wrong direction that way. And the aortic semilunar valve is located as the blood just leaves the, the left ventricle to travel out to the body, the aortic semilunar valve prevents it from accidentally flowing back into the heart and traveling in the wrong direction. So the pulmonary semilunar valve this is located right where the blood leaves the heart and the blood is traveling to the lungs. It prevents the blood from flowing back from the lungs back into the heart in the wrong direction. And the aortic semilunar valve prevents the blood from flowing from the body backwards into the, into the left ventricle. Okay, so, the, so taking a look at the two Taking a look at the two atrioventricular valves first, the tricuspid valve is located between the right atrium and the right ventricle, and the mitral valve located between the left atrium and the left ventricle.
than the two semilunar valves. I already explained what they do. Okay, so there is the tricuspid valve preventing backflow of the blood in the wrong direction from the right ventricle back, back into the right atrium. Over here, from the right ventricle, the blood is traveling to the lungs, right? And we have a valve here, that's the pulmonary semilunar valve that prevents the blood from accidentally flowing from the lungs back into the right ventricle. Over here, we have the left atrium and the left ventricle, and there's a valve right there. That's the bicuspid or the, or the mitral valve that prevents the blood from flowing from the, right, uh, the left ventricle back into the left atrium. And then you can't really see it because it's behind, it's behind the uh, pulmonary trunk, which is what this is called, but it's back there, uh, behind, basically behind the, uh, behind the pulmonary semilunar valve, you have the aortic semilunar valve. Okay, so let's just learn a couple of definitions. By definition, an artery carries blood away from the heart. And by definition, a vein carries blood back to the heart. Uh, there's a common misconception that veins always carry oxygen depleted blood and arteries always carry oxygen enriched blood, but that's a little bit incorrect because you'll find that when we get to the blood vessels that are near the heart, that definition kind of breaks down and you sometimes find veins that are carrying oxygen enriched blood and you find arteries that are carrying oxygen depleted blood. However, you'll never go wrong if you stick with the definition that, that uh, an artery carries blood away from the heart and a vein carries blood back to the heart. So let's see how well that definition works. So regardless of whether the blood is oxygenated or not, arteries carry blood away from the heart. Regardless of whether it's oxygenated or not, veins carry blood back to the heart. Already, uh, as I already explained, oxygen depleted blood has a bluish color. Right? So generally veins that are carrying oxygen depleted blood are colored blue, uh, except we'll learn there are a couple of large great vessels that break that rule. Okay, so here are some anatomy diagrams. You can see that the right side of the heart is all labeled in blue because, because that's where the oxygen depleted blood is and the left side of the heart is all colored in red. And then this diagram of the body is just demonstrating, for the most part, these are, the, uh, these are blue veins and red arteries for the most part, except for the ones that are very close to the heart. Okay, let's learn the names of some of the great vessels. Okay, so the superior vena cava, superior means above or on top of. Vena cava is a very large vein that carries blood, oxygen depleted blood back to the heart from the arms and from the brain and the upper part of the body. Right, that's the superior vena cava. And it empties the oxygen depleted blood into the right atrium. The inferior vena cava carries oxygen depleted, exhausted blood back from the lower part of the body up into the heart and delivers it to the, to the right atrium as well. So that's the inferior vena cava. The word inferior, of course, means below. Okay, then the pulmonary trunk is a great blood vessel that sends blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. Now you tell me if it, if it is oxygen depleted or oxygen enriched. Okay, so, the, so when we're sending blood to the lungs, obviously it's oxygen depleted. So the pulmonary, the, the pulmonary trunk is carrying oxygen depleted blood. The pulmonary trunk bifurcates. Remember the word bifurcates means to split in two. The, the pulmonary trunk bifurcates into the left and the right pulmonary arteries. Right, now they are called arteries, but they're not carrying oxygen enriched blood, are they? They're carrying oxygen depleted blood but we can call them arteries because they are carrying the blood away from the heart to the lungs. So our definition of arteries carrying blood away from the heart works in this case, right? So the, so, so the left and right pulmonary arteries are carrying oxygen depleted blood to the lungs. Okay, now the left and the right pulmonary veins bring the blood back to the left atrium and the, the blood is now oxygen enriched, isn't it? Nevertheless, it's traveling through some blood vessels that we call veins, and we call them veins because they're carrying blood back to the heart, and that is the definition of a vein. 
Okay, and then the aorta. The aorta is actually the the uh, strongest and thickest uh, artery in the body. It has very thick elastic walls because it's carrying ox it's carrying oxygenated blood out of the heart at very high pressure, and so it has to be able to stretch a little bit. Uh, so the aorta is the biggest and strongest artery in the body. It is an artery because because it's taking blood away from the heart. It's carrying newly oxygenated blood. Okay, now I'll tell you this: uh, when ox when the blood is carrying oxygen and and uh, wh when the when the blood travels through the lungs, it picks up oxygen and it gets rid of carbon dioxide. When you have a lot of carbon dioxide in the blood, the pH will drop, and when you have very little carbon dioxide in the blood and lots of oxygen, the pH will go up. So I often ask on exams, I ask what, uh, which artery in the body carries blood with the highest pH? And so then you can ask yourself which artery in the body carries blood that has the highest oxygen content. That would be the aorta because it hasn't had a chance yet to deliver any of that oxygen to any of the other organs or any of the other places. Uh, okay, so I sometimes ask questions like that, and, and then I'll sometimes say which which artery in the body has the lowest pH. So then you can ask yourself, well, it, that that would depend on whether it's oxygen depleted or oxygen enriched. Is it just leaving the heart or is it just arriving back at the heart? And uh, I won't give you the answer because I might ask that on a test, but but you can think about that. All right, so the aorta is the largest artery in the body, and it's, it, it is carrying blood at the highest blood pressure. If you accidentally cut that the aorta, blood will spatter a long distance. Blood will come flying out of the aorta for a, a meter or two. Um, if you're interested in police work and forensics and crime scene investigation and things like that, people who do crime scene investigation, who investigate murders and things like that, they often talk about aortic spatters. And so can you see blood that takes the shape of an aortic spatter? If you see that, it means that somebody's aorta was cut and, and you can usually tell which position, you know, if somebody is shot through the aorta, shot through the chest and it tears the, the aorta, the blood will spurt out and then you can, it, it, from where the blood ends up, you can tell what position they were standing in when they were shot and things to that effect, right? So, so that is called an aortic spatter because, because the blood is traveling at the highest pressures through the aorta, it, it actually shoots out a long way if you damage or cut the aorta. Okay, and so these are all parts of the, these are all great vessels that carry oxygen depleted blood. I've colored in blue versus red for oxygen enriched. Okay, let's just pretend that we are an oxygen depleted blood vessel and we're traveling through the heart and we will see where we end up and in which order. So let's make sure that we understand the order of blood flow through the heart. That's the purpose of this exercise. Okay, so we start in the inferior and superior vena cava. We have these blue oxygen depleted blood vessels heading back to the heart. They end up in the right atrium. From the right atrium, they travel through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. They then travel from the right ventricle through the pulmonary semilunar valve to the left and right pulmonary arteries and then towards the lungs. Then after they've been oxygen enriched, they've re been recharged, they travel through the left and right pulmon pulmonary veins from the lungs, from the lungs through the left and right pulmonary veins back to the, back to the left atrium. So we end up in the left atrium. We travel from the mitral valve, uh, through the mitral valve to the left ventricle. Then we travel through the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta and then out to the body. Right? So make sure you understand the course of or the, the course of blood traveling through the heart. Okay, here's a little exercise. You tell me which valves and which blood vessels are in contact with oxygenated blood versus deoxygenated blood. So why don't you pause the recording here and then see if you can guess and then I'll give you the answer. 
Okay, so the answer is these are actually in the right order. Right? Let's try it again. If, let's try this exercise again if I scramble them so they're not in the correct order. So once again, you tell me which of these structures will be in contact with oxygen enriched blood versus oxygen depleted blood. And the answer is Okay, so as we mentioned, the heart needs blood as well. So there are two coronary arteries that, that come directly off of the aorta and supply blood to the heart. Okay, so one of them is the, 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 the coronary arteries, there are actually two of them, they come, off of, they come off of the aorta. One of them travels to the right and the other one travels to the left. So we have the left and the right coronary arteries that are supplying blood to the heart itself. Now, the left coronary artery branches into two separate, it bifurcates into two separate arteries. One of them goes, one of them travels around the back, towards the back of the heart, and it's called the circumflex artery. The word circumflex means to go around, basically. So whenever, you, whenever we talk about arteries, whenever we talk about circumflex arteries, it's usually true that we're talking about an artery that kind of goes around a structure. It travels around a bone, or in this case, it travels around the heart. So we have the, the, the left coronary artery bifurcates into the circumflex artery, and then the other part of it, the other part of the left arter, coronary artery travels downwards on the anterior side of the heart. And so it's called the left anterior descending artery or the LAD. Right, so we have the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. The left coronary artery bifurcates into the circumflex artery and the left anterior descending artery. Now, these two arteries are very narrow and easy to block. And if you block them, you have a heart attack because the heart doesn't get enough oxygenated blood. It suffers from ischemia and it may, you know, you'll, 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 it'll, it'll get hypoxia and then necrosis and then the heart piece of the heart may die. Right, so that is a problem with the coronary arteries. There's only two of them and they're very narrow. And the, nar the, the more narrow an artery is, the easier it is to block with something called an embolus. And so an embolus is basically a, a floating blood clot that's traveling around the body. And we are gonna talk about that in detail later. So if you block the coronary artery and that causes you to have a heart attack, sometimes people refer to that as a coronary. Somebody says I had a coronary a couple of years ago. That means they had a heart attack because one of the coronary arteries was blocked. So here you can see the diagram. So here's the aorta. And then coming off of the aorta, we have the right coronary artery. And then the left coronary artery. Here the coronary art, left coronary artery bifurcates and part of it travels around to the back of the heart. That's the circumflex artery. The other half continues to travel straight down and so that's that's the left anterior descending artery. Okay, now what about the blood vessels that take the blood away from the heart after it's oxygen depleted? We're not, there are lots of them, but we're not gonna learn lots of them. We're just gonna learn the name of one of them, a big one, and it's called the coronary sinus. You remember from our discussion of the brain and the nervous system that large veins are sometimes referred to as a sinus. Large veins that have a s blood traveling slowly through them are sometimes referred to as a sinus. So the, so the blood, is the coronary artery, sorry, the coronary sinus is located on the posterior side of the heart and it travels directly back into the right atrium. So here you can see the coronary sinus. So we're on the posterior side of the heart and it delivers, it, it has quite a few branches. Uh, we're not gonna learn them all, but it delivers, it, it delivers the blood into the coronary sinus and from there back into the right atrium. Okay, so here's another view. This view is from your textbook, just showing the left and the right coronary arteries, as well as some of the cardiac veins. All right, now this is a scan which where you inject somebody with a radioactive dye that can be seen by a what's basically a fancy x-ray machine. And you can see the flow of blood through the heart Right. And here you can see that there, this, this narrow, uh, you can see the heart here. And this narrow, this narrowing part right here uh, 
is a blockage of the common trunk of the left coronary artery, right? So that would be, you know, you would end up having a blockage there. So that would give you a heart attack. And then here's a narrowing or a blockage of the circumflex artery. So these are examples of coronary blockages. So this is an example of coronary artery disease or CAD. All right, so what do you do if you want to widen the, you have a narrowing, well, uh, some of these are blockages and some of these are just narrowing. If you narrow, if you have a constricted flow of blood through an artery, it may be due to the fact that the artery has become narrow because it's basically been clogged by stuff, by junk on the inside called plaque. Uh, plaque is a mis mixture of lipids and, and uh, cholesterol and things like that. So when you talk about eating fast food and you eat transunsaturated fats, which we discussed before, that can actually clog your arteries and lead to, among other problems, it can lead to coronary artery disease, which causes heart attacks. So the, the, the coronary arteries are narrow enough to begin with. They're already narrow enough. If you make them even narrower, the odds of accidentally blocking them one day with an embolus becomes even greater. So it's in your interest if you have narrowed arteries, uh, that's something called occlusion of the artery. We'll talk about that later, but it's called occlusion of the artery. If you have an occluded artery, it's in your interest to open it up so that it's wider and it will be less easily blocked by an embolus, which could kill you. So. Uh, cardiologists will take a close look at somebody's heart, you know, and they'll they'll do this kind of a test and they'll see that the walls of the coronary arteries are becoming narrow and then they will open them up again using a device called a stent and a technique called angioplasty. Okay, so how do you widen, there's that word I was talking about, how do you widen an occluded artery? Well, what you do is you stick in, you do something called balloon angioplasty where you insert something called a stent. A stent is a, is a wire mesh that, ex, that uh, you can, it, it's narrow when you put it in and then when you try to pull it out, it expands like a spring and it has the effect of holding the artery open. It usually contains a balloon inside, so you stick this thing in and then you inflate the balloon to widen the artery and then you quickly deflate the balloon and then you pull it back out and you leave the expanded stent in place. And that's how you repair an occluded artery. That's how you widen an occluded artery. Okay, so you can see here how this is done. You put in a little wire into one of the arteries and it contains the wire mesh thing in the balloon. You inflate the balloon quickly, and then you deflate the balloon and pull it out, and then you allow that allows the blood to flow freely through the artery again. And so that's called a balloon angioplasty. The stent is more visible here, so you stick this, this wire catheter into one of the arteries, and so here we have an occluded artery. It's narrower than it should be because it's clogged with plaque. And then we inflate the balloon, which has the effect of widening the wire mesh, the stent, and then you deflate the balloon and you pull the catheter wire back out and you leave this metal stent right there which holds the artery open. Right? So that's a balloon angioplasty which is used to treat coronary artery disease and to widen an occluded artery. Of course, the trick is it's much better not to get an occluded artery to begin with, and you can avoid that by not eating transunsaturated fats, junk food, chips, deep fried potato chips, uh, chick chicken McNuggets, uh, and getting regular cardiovascular exercise and, and, and controlling and uh, you know, lowering the amount of fats and lipids that we eat and uh, lowering the amount of cholesterol that we eat. As we mentioned at the beginning of the course, cholesterol is actually good for you. You need cholesterol in every cell of the body, but it's bad if you have cholesterol floating around loose in the blood, right? So cholesterol is good for you unless you have excess amounts of it floating around in the blood, in which case you could get uh, you know, occluded arteries, coronary artery disease and other, uh, other uh, other other forms of occlusion. Okay, that's just a closer look at a balloon uh, balloon stent, balloon angioplasty.
and here it is if you see it in real time. So here's the here's the occluded artery. You can see that there's very little blood getting through. That's what that line represents. So you blow it up with a balloon and then you leave the stent and there it is. All right, let's take a closer look at the myocardium, the, the heart muscle itself. You remember from the uh, chapter that we did on histology, the most visible feature of cardiac muscle are the intercalated discs, these little these little uh, lo these little lines that run perpendicular to the uh, run perpendicular to the contractile to the muscle fibers, and their purpose is to help transmit the electrical signals, the neural signals around the heart in order to make the heart contract. But if you're looking at heart tissue, that's the most obvious feature. So here's a better better image of them. You can see these lines. So the, the, the muscle fibers run this way and the intercalated discs run perpendicular to the, to the muscle fibers. Okay, now let's take a look at the parts of the heart that divide chambers. Right, so as we said before, there's a wall. The, words, the word septum is Latin for wall. The interatrial septum separates the two atria, as you'd expect. The intra, intraventricular septum separates the two ventricles. The, in, the intraatrial septum is quite thin because we don't need a lot of muscle to pump blood just the short distance from the atria to the ventricle. But the intraventricular septum is quite thick because it has to pump blood out of the heart all the way around the body. And then there's another, obviously, the uh, we mentioned the fact that the atria are separated from the ventricles by valves, but the valves for, form part of a, of a sort of a floor. So the atrial floor is referred to as the atrioventricular septum because this, this uh, kind of a floor that has the valves in it is separating the atria from the ventricles. Okay, so you can see that the atria have the atrial septum is thin, the ventricular septum is quite thick. The atrioventricular septum is almost a, it's almost a, a semantic thing. It's do you call it a wall or just valves? I don't know, it's a matter of semantics. And as we mentioned earlier, the left ventricle, it, the left ventricle is surrounded by a thicker layer of myocardium than the right ventricle because it has to pump blood a farther distance. It has to send it out to the body instead of just to the lungs. By the way, the myocardial fibers form a kind of an interesting figure eight structure around the two ventricles. I, I will not ask you about that, but it's kind of interesting to look at. So you see the figure eight structure, the way these the, the fibers of myocardium kind of wrap around the two. And then here we have the we have the right ventricle, which has thinner walls than the left ventricle, the left ventricle because the left ventricle has to pump blood a farther distance. And here's the kind of the figure eight structure that the that the myocardium makes in order to surround these ventricles and atria. Okay, let's take a closer look at the valves. As I said, they have leaflets or cusps. The tricuspid valve has three of them and the mitral valve has two. That's why it's sometimes called the bicuspid valve. The semilunar valves have three cuspids and supposedly somebody thought that they looked like a half moon, which is a half moon is what, what the term semilunar means. Um, I, don't, I don't see it. I don't know about you, but I don't see it. I don't know who gave it that name. All right, so you can see here the tricuspid valve is over here. So we have this is a transverse section through the heart. It's a superior view of a transverse section of the heart. We're looking down into the heart. So you can see the tricuspid valve has three cusps. The mitral valve, the bicuspid, has two cusps. And then here we have the aortic semilunar valve doesn't really look like a half moon to me and we have the pulmonary semilunar valve. By the way, this stuff down here is adipose tissue. There's usually a certain amount of adipose tissue that's kind of stuck onto the heart, which is normal. It's not abnormal. Now, if these if these leaflets, these cusps on the valves become stiff, they may not close properly. And if they don't close properly, they become leaky. So then you have blood flowing in the wrong direction and that's called regurgitation. So when the valves become a little bit stiff and they don't close properly, that's called valve stenosis. It is sometimes caused by calcification where you have 
calcium mixed with cholesterol and stuff like that kind of uh, saturating the leaflets and so they're stiffer than they should be. Right? And then you have regurgitation. Okay, now usually you don't have you don't usually have a problem with valve prolapse because the cusps of the uh, the cusps of the valve are meant to point in one direction, and they are actually held in that direction by little cords, little strings that are referred to as chordae tendinae. Right, and the chordae tendinae are attached to little bumps in the cardiac muscle, which is found on the on the bottom side of the ventricle, and they're referred to as papillary muscles. So let's take a look at those. Okay, so you notice how here we have the cusps or the leaflets of the valves, and they are actually attached by little strings to the papillary muscles that are located at the bottom of the atria, uh, sorry, at the bottom of the ventricle. And here you can see a picture of a, an open heart where you can see the chordae tendinae and the, pap and the papillary muscles. So, the, the purpose of these structures is to prevent the, the cusps from snapping back and facing in the wrong direction, which would be very bad because the blood would flow in the wrong direction that way. Okay, so the chordae tendinae prevent the leaflets from bending in the wrong direction, from snapping in the reverse direction. However, if one of the if the if some or all of the chordae tendinae break or if they stretch so that they're loose, then you might have the valve cusps facing in the wrong direction. If you have them facing in the wrong direction, that's referred to as valve prolapse. Valve prolapse. Okay, so here we have an example of valve prolapse where one of the valves has one of the valves has kind of flipped and it's facing the wrong way. There's quite a lot of regurgitation that results from that. All right, now you might have gone to the doctor and the doctor put their stethoscope on your chest at four distinct places and listened to your heart. And then they usually put your steth they put the stethoscope on your back and they say, take a deep breath. And so they're, they're listening to see if your lungs are clear when they do that. But when they put the stethoscope on those four spots on the front of your chest, they're actually listening to these four valves to see if they're closing properly. Right, so the, this is when you do this, when you actually listen to the valves closing with a stethoscope, I'm sure you know what a stethoscope is. If not, I'll show you one. But when you do that, it's called auscultation. It's called auscultation of the heart or aus auscultation of the heart valves. And this is an interesting thing to do because we live in a country that has a, a public health care system, a universal public health care system, where everybody, whether they're rich or they're poor, everybody is having to pay for the health care system. And so it's within our interests to use the best techniques to take care of our health for everybody, but also use the cheapest technique that is effective. Right, so you don't want to have a cheap technique that's no good or a cheap technique that's not as good. But if you have a simple, cheap way of testing something that is just as good as an expensive, fancy way of testing it, you should use the cheap, effective, the cheap and simple way because it's in everyone's interest that the healthcare system doesn't become too expensive. So this is something that is encouraged uh, when people become doctors. They, If you're a general... A general practitioner, a GP, you'll be doing this all day. You'll be listening to the listening to people's heart, and this is a very cheap. Uh, it takes a bit of practice and a bit of skill, but this is a very cheap and practical way to tell whether the valves are functioning properly, and it's uh, it's encouraged. Right? So what you do is the stethoscope has two sides. One side is called a diaphragm that has a, a layer of plastic over it, and the other side is called the bell that doesn't. And what you do is you place the bell on four specific spots to listen to a thump and not a whoosh of the valve, right? So if you hear that thump, 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 the valve is closing properly, which is what it's supposed to do. If you hear a kind of woof, woof, woof like that, it's not closing properly. So that whooshing sound is sometimes called a heart murmur. All right, so here we have somebody listening to the heart. I think that's probably an actor because he's using the wrong side of the stethoscope. Um, but this is the bell, and that's the side you're supposed to do the auscultations with, and this is the diaphragm that you do that you do other things with.
All right, so here are the four positions. If you so um, the the positioning of the bell of the stethoscope will allow you to listen to the four valves. So the, how do we figure out where we are? Right. So in, one of the things we're learning about in this course is we're learning about anatomical landmarks. So are there parts of the body or features of the body that you can see which allow you to figure out where parts of the body are that you cannot see? So in this case, we're going to use the ribs and the sternum to position the, the stethoscope to listen to the heart. So the way we do that is you can usually feel the ribs through the skin. Right? So this is the first rib. This is the second rib. And the, the space between the second and the third rib, notice that you have spaces in between, right? So we have the first and second rib, and then the area in between the first and second rib is referred to as the first intercostal space, the first intercostal space. Remember that the word costal refers to the ribs. Okay, where did we put the stethoscope here? We put it at the second intercostal space on the right sternal border. Right. And then if you put the stethoscope bell there, you will be listening to the aortic, uh, that is called the aortic area, and you'll be listening to the aortic valve. You'll be listening to the, to the pulmonary, uh, the a pulmonary, aortic pulmonary, or sorry, the, uh, the, the aortic semilunar valve. Right. Okay, then if you do the same thing over here, second intercostal space on the, on the left sternal border, you'll be listening to the pulmonary semilunar valve. And then if you put it, if you go to the fourth intercostal space and you put the stethoscope in the middle, you'll list, you're listening to the tricuspid valve. And then if you take the clavicle on the left-hand side and you go halfway down the clavicle, it's called, you draw an imaginary line halfway down the clavicle. That's called the midclavicular line. If you take the left midclavicular line and you go to the fifth intercostal space at the left midclavicular line, you'll be listening to the mitral valve. Right, so that's auscultation of the heart. This uh, diagram is from your OpenStax textbook. It's not as good as the one I just showed you, but this is the diagram that your textbook has. It doesn't show you the positioning of the ribs, but uh, that's, that's the way you would position the, the bell of the stethoscope in order to auscultate the valves of the heart. Let's turn now to the layers of the heart tissue. If you start from the inside and go out, let's say that we're inside an atrium. The inside of the atrium is lined with a layer of simple squamous epithelium, uh, which we call the endocardium. All right, so remember, we have special names that we call these basic types of epithelial tissue. We give them special names depending on where we find them in the body. All right, so the layer of simple squamous epithelium that lines the inside of the heart is called the endocardium. The endocardium is actually continuous, contiguous with the blood vessels. And then remember that we call that same layer of tissue the endo, uh, endothelium when we're talking about the inside of a blood vessel, but it's the same thing. Right. And then, then after you get past the endocardium, you get to the myocardium, which is the cardiac muscle itself. And then there's a layer of tissue, simple squamous epithelium, outside the myocardium, which is actually the inner layer of the of the pericardial uh, the pericardial serous membrane. And so remember that whenever you have a pericardial membrane, it has an inner layer and an outer layer and a layer of and a, a layer of fluid in between. The purpose of serous membranes is usually to to prevent friction between moving parts of the body. Right, so the heart is surrounded by a membrane called the pericardium. The inner layer is called the visceral layer. The outer layer is called the parietal layer. The, so in this case, the epicardium is just a special name that we give to the visceral layer of the pericardium. Right, so that, so uh, that's actually, but it's called the epicardium, but it's actually the visceral layer of the pericardium. Okay, then we have a pericardial cavity that's filled with fluid, serous fluid, for lubrication. The purpose of that is to prevent friction of the heart with the ribs. So the heart is constantly beating. We have to pre uh, prevent it from rubbing up against the ribs and causing damage and friction. So we have a layer of serous fluid. And then the outer layer of the, ser the serous pericardium is generally called the parietal layer. In this case, we call it the parietal pericardium. And then outside of the serous membrane, there's another layer of fibrous tissue, which is very, very tough. And this, this layer of tough tissue is called the, fi the fibrous pericardium. 
and it's made of fibrous connective tissue. And as you know, fibrous connective tissue is very strong because the, the uh, you know, the ligaments, sorry, the tendons are made of fibrous connective tissue. So just once more, here's our diagram. On the very in, inner surface, we have the endocardium. It's just a simple layer of simple squamous epithelium. Then we have the muscle layer. That's the myocardium. Then we have the epicardium, which is the vi actually the visceral layer of the serous, serous of the serous membrane. Then we have the pericardial cavity, which is the layer of fluid in between the two layers. Then we have the parietal layer of the serous pericardium and then the fibrous pericardium on the outside. So these are the layers of the heart from the inside to the outside. Let's turn now and look at some of the physiology of the heart. Okay, the word systole, the word systole refers to when the heart muscles are contracting and squeezing, squeezing the blood out of the heart. That's referred to as systole. Diastole is where the heart relaxes and lets blood in. Right, so when you're feeling your pulse, the, when you feel the beat, if you're, if you're feeling one of your arteries, you feel your heartbeat. The beat is actually the systole. And then when the space in between beats is actually the diastole of the heart. Okay, so there are actually three parts to a heartbeat. If you've seen a heart beating, I'm sure you might have seen that on television and movies and things. You've seen that the, the top part of the heart where the atria are and the bottom part of the heart where the ventricles are don't beat at the same time. They do not, right? So the, basically what happens is the atria squeeze. So the atria beat first and send the blood into the, into the ventricles. And then the atria relax and the ventricles squeeze to shoot the blood out of the heart. So it looks, it, it's, there's kind of like, there's two major parts to a heartbeat and then, uh, you know, some minor, minor bits as well. Okay, so in truth, it, you know, it, in, in total, there's three major parts to a heartbeat that we define as follows. First of all, cardiac, cardiac diastole is where the entire heart relaxes to allow blood to fill it. Then we have the atria squeezing while the ventricles are relaxed. So that's referred to as atrial systole ventri ventricular diastole. So the atria are pushing the blood into the ventricles. And then the next step is where the atria relax and the ventricles push and that's called atrial diastole ventricular systole. So the ventricles contract while the atria are relaxed and they push the blood out of the body. So those are the three major parts of a heartbeat, of a heartbeat cardiac diastole, atrial systole ventricular diastole, atrial diastole ventricular systole. So here we have cardiac diastole where the entire heart relaxes to let blood flow in. And then we have Atrial systole, where the, vent, where the atria are, are pushing the blood into the ventricles, and the ventricles are relaxed, basically. And then we have ventricular systole, where the ventricles are pushing the blood out of the body, out of the heart, rather. So this is just a diagram illustrating how long each of those, relatively how long each of those parts lasts. Uh, they're not all the same length, but we're not going to learn about that in this course. We're not going to, so you don't have to memorize that. All right, so how do you take a pulse? How do you measure the heart, re heart rate? Or how do you measure how fast the heart is beating? Okay, so the heartbeat can be felt through any of the arteries that are close to the skin, or do you remember from our first uh, week in the, in, the, in the course, we say that anything that's close to the surface of the skin is referred to as superficial. Anything that's farther away is deep. So, so you can measure the heart rate from any of the superficial arteries, any of the arteries that are close to the surface of the skin that you can get at. Okay, so the systole versus the diastole is a pulse, that's the heartbeat. And the most common place that people usually take a pulse from, the easiest place is the radial artery. There are many other arteries where you can measure the pulse, but the radial artery is just convenient. It's that one where you push, you push your two index and middle finger against the artery, which is running just in front of the, uh, just anterior to the radius. Right, so when you push on the artery, it has no place to go because the 
you know, you're, you're pushing on it with your finger and it can't move back out of the way because the, the radius is behind it. So you can actually feel the pulse quite easily there. And then you count with your watch or just count a minute. And then heart rate is expressed as beats per minute, beats per minute. In truth, nobody bothers. Most people don't bother to, 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 to record the pulse for the whole minute. Most people just take a pulse for 15 seconds and then multiply it by four, or they take a pulse for 30 seconds and multiply it by two, and then you've got the beats per minute. So here's what you do. You just push your middle and, uh, middle and index fing finger against the radial artery and count uh, measure 30 on your watch, and then you can tell the heart rate. All right, the normal range for a normal pulse is around 60 to 100 beats per minute. Three words that you need to memorize. The word tachycardia, we heard about this in the first lecture when we did the, the root word exercise. Tachycardia means too fast. That generally means more than 100 beats per minute. Bradycardia means a pulse that's too slow, a heart rate that, that's too slow, usually below 50 or 40. But there's one caveat, and that caveat is for athletes. Uh, for, for athletes who are conditioned to have a good cardiovascular functioning, they have a slower uh, resting heart rate. Right? So it's not unusual if you have a marathon runner or a pentathlon runner or some, somebody like that, uh, if, they're in, if they're in excellent physical condition, excellent cardiovascular condition, it's not unusual for them to have a heart rate that's lower than 40. That's normal. Okay, then dysrhythmias, cardiac dysrhythmias, this, you know, rhythm, you know what that means, a regular beat. If there's an irregular beat, it's called a cardiac dysrhythmia, or irregular heartbeats, and there are various things that can cause that, and there are various reasons or various ways to correct it. All right, so these, by the way, are other places where you can take a pulse. I sometimes ask about these on exams, right? So the temporal artery is obviously in the head by the temple. The facial artery is basically on the on the face near the buccal cavity. The coron the the carotid the carotid artery is the artery in your neck, which is taking there's a left and a right carotid artery which is taking blood up to the brain. The radial artery, which is the one we usually use, the femoral artery is in the groin area. The popliteal artery, where do you think that is? Where's the popliteal region again? If you said it's on the back of the knee, that's right. The posterior tibial artery and the, dors the dorsalis pedis arteries are on the inner ankle and on the top of the foot, respectively. Why would you care about all these? Uh, well, because for some reason, sometimes it's not possible to get to the radial artery, or sometimes there might be some damage to the arm so that you suspect that, that if you take the radial pulse, it will give you the wrong answer. So, so uh, there, there are lots of reasons why you'd want to take the pulse from someplace else. Okay, so here's where all these areas are. Right, so the temporal artery is at the temple. The facial artery is here by the mandible. Carotid artery is in the neck. Brachial artery. Is, I forgot to mention that over here, but the brachial artery is in the brachium, just above the elbow, uh, and that's the, art the the brachial artery. By the way, is the number one common, the the most common artery to measure blood pressure. So at the moment, we're not concerned about the blood pressure; we're just concerned about how many times a minute the heart is beating. But we'll come back to the brachial artery for when we talk about blood pressure. So remember that one. Okay. Then the radial artery is the most common one. The femoral artery is located at the top of the femur in the groin area, the popliteal artery, the posterior tibial artery, and the dorsal pedis artery. Any of these can be used to take a pulse. Okay, I'm going to tell you about something here, and we will come back to it again later. But just for fun, I'm going to tell you that Sometimes you want to measure whether the arteries are functioning properly at different parts of the body, or is the blood not flowing as well through the peripheral parts of the body as it is through the central part of the body. So is the blood having a hard time flowing, flowing through your arms and legs relative to your torso and your abdomen? If you wanted to determine that, you would take something, you would take something called the ankle brachial index, and this is where you measure the blood pressure at the ankle and again at the brachium. Right? So you would measure the blood pressure at the posterior tibial artery, and then you'd measure the blood pressure at the brachial artery, and then you'd, you, 
you would take the ankle systole over the brachial systole, you would divide the two to get a ratio. And if that ratio is smaller than 0 0.9, you may have something called peripheral artery disease, which just means that there's a, there's a problem with the arteries in the peripheral parts of the body. Right, so you take the blood pressure at the brachium and you take the blood pressure at the anterior tibial, at the, uh, sorry, at the posterior tibial artery, and you compare the two. You divide the ankle, ankle systole, uh, the, an the systolic pressure at the ankle by the systolic pressure at the brachium, and then you get a ratio. If it's less, less than 0.9, that's an indication of PAD. Okay, how much blood does the heart put out? That's referred to as cardiac output. Now here's the interesting thing. Cardiac output is measured as the amount of blood put out per minute by one ventricle, not by the whole heart. So if you're interested in knowing how much blood is put out by the whole heart, you have to double the cardiac output. Right? So you have to double the figure that you derive for cardiac output. Okay, so let's figure out the cardiac output, which is the amount of blood pumped out of each ventricle per minute. And you do this by measuring or estimating the stroke volume. Right, so the stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped by one ventricle in the average beat. There are various ways to measure that, but let's just, we don't really have easy access to measuring that. Let's just say for the average resting person, for the average person at rest, the stroke volume is about 70 milliliters per ventricle. Right. So you take the stroke volume and you multiply the stroke volume by the heart rate to get the cardiac output. Right. So obviously the cardiac output will vary depending on how fast your heart is beating. Right. So you measure the card, you calculate the cardiac output by multiplying the heart, the heart rate by the stroke volume. The stroke volume, if I ask you about this on a test, I will give you the stroke volume, but it's, you can assume that it's around 70 milliliters per ventricle. And then you simply multiply the heart rate times 70, 70 milliliters, and that gives you uh, milliliters per minute. Okay, example. Let's say we have somebody with a 60 beats per minute pulse, and then 60 beats per minute times 70 milliliters is about 4.2 liters per minute per ventricle. Right, so to in total, that would be a heart output of 8.4 liters, but we, only, we don't measure uh, cardiac output that way. Uh, so we measure it 4.2 liters per ventricle per minute. All right, now there's another thing you need to know about called the cardiac reserve, and that is the difference between the cardiac output when you're resting versus the cardiac output when you're exercising. So in this case, what you do is, let's say that you run, you're running and your pulse rate goes up to 120 beats per minute from 60, right? So then you calculate the cardiac output at 120 beats per minute. You calculate the car cardiac output at 60 beats per minute, and then you subtract this is the critical part. You subtract the uh, output when you're working from, the, uh, sorry, you subtract the cardiac output, the resting cardiac output from the working cardiac output to give you the cardiac reserve. Right, so, so notice what, what we've done here is if you have 4.2 liters at 60 beats per minute, of course you'll have 8.4 liters at 120 beats per minute, won't you? But the cardiac reserve is not 120 beats per minute. The, the cardiac reserve is 8.4 liters minus the resting cardiac output of 4.2. And so the reserve is how much blood your heart can put out beyond the resting heart cardiac output. Right? In this case, it happens to be 4.2 liters. So make sure you're clear on those uh, those values and that procedure. Okay, how do we measure blood pressure? Uh, it's done all the same thanks to a, ni a 19th century Russian named Nikolai Korotkov. Uh, and so the word Korotkov, the reason I'm telling you the guy's name is because part of the procedure is named after Korotkov. Right? So this is a Russian physician who invented this technique around 1900. You need two pieces of equipment. You need, what was this thing called again? This is the stethoscope. And this thing over here, there's an inflatable, there's an inflatable rubber cuff that you can inflate with air. 
And the air pressure inside that cuff is measured by this thing here, which measures the, the pressure, the air pressure inside that inflatable cuff based on millimeters of mercury. So this thing is filled with mercury. The higher the pressure rises, the farther this mercury rises up in this little machine here. And it's measured in millibars. Pressure is generally measured in millibars, right? So what we're going to do basically is we're going to take this machine on the left, which is called a sphygmomanometer, and you put that inflatable cuff from the sphygmomanometer over your brachial artery, around your brachial artery, and then you inflate the cuff until you can no longer hear sounds of blood pumping through the arteries. When you hear sounds pumping through the arteries, you hear this kind of thump, 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 which is, which is the sound of blood pumping through the artery. That's called a Karotkov sound after Nikolai Karotkov. So that's why we listen to the artery just below the level of the sphygmomanometer. And so when we stop, so we pump that cuff up until we can't hear the Karotkov sounds anymore. And then we release it slowly and, uh, well, I'll show you on the next slide. All right, so we need a sphygmomanometer. We put a sphygmomanometer over around the brachial artery. And then we listen, we put a stethoscope in the crook of the elbow just underneath the uh, sphygmomanometer, like so. So what you do is you pump it until you can't hear the, the Karotkov sounds anymore, and then you release the pressure slowly. And when you just start to hear the Karotkov sounds again, you, you record the level of mercury, millimeters of mercury, as the systolic pressure. And then you continue releasing the pressure until you can't hear the sounds anymore because what's happening is that the, that the artery becomes so loose that it's not, the blood is not banging against the side of the artery anymore and making this sound. And so you can't hear it anymore. So, so you continue releasing the pressure until you just stop hearing the Karotkov sounds. And you refer to that as the diastolic pressure. And then you, record, you report the blood pressure as the ratio of the systole over the diastole. So for a normal healthy adult, that would be 120 over 70. What are the units? Well, the, it's unitless because the 120 is measured in millimeters and the 70 is me measured in millimeters. So the 120 millimeters is the systolic pressure and the 70 millimeters is the diastolic pressure. Now, sometimes I ask on exams, I ask, get, what is the systolic pressure for, for a young, healthy adult? And people will put down 120, but that's not the correct answer because uh, you didn't give me the millimeters. Or sometimes people will write down 120 over 70. And again, that's not the right answer because you've given me the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. Right, so I, I only asked for the systolic pressure. Or I might similarly, I might ask for just what is the diastolic blood pressure for a young healthy adult? The answer is 70 millimeters. Uh, the, and the systolic pressure for a young healthy adult is 120 millimeters. The Blood pressure, typical blood pressure for a young, healthy adult is 120 over 70, which is the correct answer. Okay, so here we're illustrating this again. When you first put on the sphygmomanometer and you start to pump it up and you listen with the stethoscope, you won't actually hear anything because you won't start to hear the Karotkov sounds until the pressure has been built up around the brachial artery a little bit. Right, so, so you put the sphygmomanometer around, you listen with the stethoscope. As soon as you, as soon as you start listening, you won't hear anything. So you start pumping up the, the inflatable cuff, and then you will start to hear Karotkov sounds. You keep going, you keep pumping, and then eventually you keep pumping until you can't hear the Karotkov sounds anymore, and that will actually be beyond the systolic pressure. So that's not the systolic pressure. But from that point, from that point, you start lowering the pressure until you just start to hear the Karotkov sounds again. And as soon as you start hearing the Karotkov sounds again, you record that as the systolic pressure. And then you keep releasing the pressure until you stop hearing the Karotkov sounds again, and you record that as the diastolic pressure. And then you report the blood pressure as, as the diastole over, sorry, the systole over the diastole. Okay, what is it that determines blood pressure anyway? Well, to begin with, we, we have two different 
ways that we measure blood pressure, that we talk about blood pressure. The hydrostatic blood pressure is actually, is the actual physical pressure of the blood, right? the physical pressure of the blood, right? And so, you know, any liquid has a pressure in the, in the vessels that it's traveling through. And you can measure that with a mercury barometer of some sort, right? And then the oncotic pressure is kind of a, it's kind of like potential energy in the sense that it's not, it's not really the physical pressure, but it's the, it's a measurement of the tendency of water to go from soft tissues of, of the body into the blood as a result of the tonicity of the blood. So we talked in the, uh, when we discussed the chemistry chapter, we talked about the tonicity and putting cells into hypertonic solutions, right? So the blood cells are in, in serum, they're floating around in serum. And the serum has a certain amount of proteins in it and a certain amount of salts in it. And so that will determine the tendency of water to leak into the blood vessels as a result of the, the, uh, as a result of the tonicity of the blood. Right, so that's measured as oncotic pressure. Okay, now beyond that, how do we, what are the things that determine the blood pressure? Okay, so first of all, the heart rate will determine the blood pressure, right? So if you increase the heart rate, the blood pressure will go up. If you decrease the heart rate, the blood pressure will go down. Remember, some of this is controlled by the vagus nerve. Right, so increase or decrease the heart rate to make the blood pressure go up or down. Next, you can make the blood vessels wider or narrower, right? And that will have an effect on blood pressure as well. So if you make the, if you make the blood vessels wider, that's called vasodilation, vasodilation. So you, you know when you go to the optometrist and they put those drops in your eyes to make your pupils dilate, your pupils get very wide, that's called dilation, means that you open up uh, the diameter of, a, of an opening. Right, so if you if you do vasodilation, the blood pressure tends to go down. If you make the arteries and the blood vessels narrower, that's called vasoconstriction, and that tends to make the blood pressure go up. And those two things, vasodilation and vasoconstriction, are a function of the autonomic nervous system, as we talked about before. Okay, now here's this part gets a little tricky. Let me let me go down to point number four first. Right, the blood volume will determine the blood pressure because obviously, let's say that you have a piece of hose. Now you have a piece of hose. If you put one liter of water, just fills up that hose. If you can then somehow push another liter of water into that hose, the water inside that hose will be under higher pressure, won't it? So the volume of fluid that's inside that hose will also determine the blood pressure. Right, so if you increase the amount, if you increase the blood volume, blood pressure tends to go up. If you decrease blood pressure, if sorry, if you decrease blood volume, blood pressure tends to go down. Generally, you don't increase the amount of blood cells to make the volume go up and down, but you increase the amount of serum. You increase the amount of liquid, the the liquid portion of the blood to make the pressure go up and down. Right, so so. Um, one of the ways that you can increase or decrease the volume of the blood is it's the responsibility of the renal system. Uh, whether or not your kidneys are retaining water or not will partly determine the volume of blood. So that's another thing. Okay, but now there's another way that you can increase or decrease the volume of blood and that's by varying the tonicity of the blood, right? So if the blood is saltier and contains more proteins, the blood will be hypertonic relative to the tissue surrounding it and fluid will flow into the blood vessels, increasing the blood volume and therefore increasing the blood pressure. On the other hand, if the blood doesn't have very much protein or very much salt in it, it will, the blood will be hypotonic relative to the surrounding tissues. And so water will leak out of the blood vessels into the surrounding tissues, causing swelling, by the way, causing the surrounding tissues to swell. But nevertheless, you will have reduced the blood volume and lowered the blood pressure, right? So the, the three main things that determine the blood pressure are the heart rate, the diameter of the blood vessels, and the volume of fluid that is present in the, in the blood, right? And the volume of the blood volume is determined partly by the tonicity of the blood, which you can vary by producing more or less of a protein called serum albumin, which is produced by the liver.
Right? So the tonicity of the blood is regulated by the level of serum albumin. The level of serum albumin is determined by the liver. So that's one of the important things that the liver does. We're going to learn later on, of course, that the liver does all kinds of things. The liver is an extremely important organ that never never gets the attention that it deserves. The The brain and the heart get all of the publicity. The liver does all of the work. And so one of the neat things that the liver does is it produces serum albumin, and that will cause the blood to become hypertonic or hypotonic, and then the volume will go up or down. Okay, let's talk about electrical activity of the heart rate. We already talked about this. The vagus nerve and some of the and some other nerves that are referred to as the sympathetic cardiac nerves control the heart rate, right? And they are uh, they come out through the brain stem and travel down to control the heart. Okay, now what about once the signal telling the heart to beat arrives at the heart, that signal has to be propagated to the rest of the heart. The signal arrives from the brain, usually at this area right here, the sinoatrial node, which is sometimes referred to as the pacemaker, right, the pacemaker. So you can stimulate the entire heart to beat if you stimulate just the pacemaker at the sinoatrial node. Okay, so the first impulses that tell the heart to beat arrive at the sinoatrial node, also known as the pacemaker, and you've probably heard of artificial pacemakers. There are people in the world who have an irregular heartbeat, and in order to make your heartbeat regularly, somebody has implanted a pacemaker under the skin of the chest, and that pacemaker is basically just a battery with a little electrical wire. The wire travels down and makes contact with the heart at the, at the pacemaker region, at the sinoatrial node, and it basically gives the heart a little shock to make it beat regularly instead of irregularly. And so that's an artificial pacemaker, but the natural pacemaker is the sinoatrial node. Okay, so the signal is received at the sinoatrial node. The signal will then be transmitted very quickly to another structure called the atrioventricular node or the AV. And then from the atrioventricular node, it is transmitted rapidly down the ventricular septum down the ventricular septum to uh, using some bundles of fibers that are called bundle branches or bundles of bundle of hiss and the signal is transmitted down to the bottom of the heart to the apex and then from the apex bang everything is transmitted up uh, transmitted up from the apex using a, a special type of fiber called a Perkin J fiber that causes the entire cardiac muscle to contract Right, so stimulation at the sinoatrial node, then from there down to the atrioventricular node, from the atrioventricular node to the apex, and then bang to the outside of the heart via Perkin J fibers, so the whole heart beats. So this is what it looks like. The first part of the heart rate, the signal arrives at the pacemaker, the sinoatrial node. And that causes that basically causes the atria to contract. Right? The signal is then transmitted to the atrioventricular node, and then from there down through the bundle of hiss to the apex of the heart, and then up through the Perkin J fibers to cause the whole heart to beat. And these movements of electricity through the heart can be measured using a thing called an electrocardiogram. So this is <clears throat> this is where you put electrodes on your body, uh, on your chest, and you measure these electrical discharges that are kind of incidental to the muscle contracting. And you can tell if the heart is beating. All of the parts of the heartbeat are functioning properly by looking at the ECG, the electrocardiogram. Okay, so one more time. Signal arrives at the pacemaker, the sinoatrial node. That the, the, the pacemaker signal causes the atria to contract, atrial, uh, atrial systole. The signal is then transmitted down to the atrioventricular node, from the atrial ventricular node down to the apex through the bundle branches or bundle of hiss, and then up through the Perkin J fibers to the outside of the heart, causing the ventricles to beat ventricular systole. So let's talk about 
an electrocardiogram. This is where you this is where uh, this is where you put electrodes onto the body at different places, and then you measure these heartbeats electrically into something called an electrocardiogram. By the way, just as a little career advice, you can go to BCIT and you can become a, a, an ECG technician. Uh, I don't know offhand, I don't know how long the program is, but it's one of these jobs, one of these nice jobs that you can get. It's in the medical allied health professions. Um, you know, if you're a doctor or a nurse, you're said to be in the health profession. If you're any of these other technicians that do any of the jobs that are, that, that are associated with those jobs, it's referred to as the allied health professions. So if you're a physiotherapist or a perfusion technician or an electrocardiogram technician, or an echocardiogram technician, which is another test that you can do, then you're a member of the allied health professions. And BCIT has quite a, has all of the programs that teach you how to do that. And so if you have your ECG technician's certificate, you can do this job in a hospital or for a, for a cardiologist. Among the things that you would learn are all of the proper places to put all of the electrodes to give you a good picture of the, of the heart beating and the heart functioning. Right. Okay, so this is this is an electrocardiogram, and this is the wave. This is the electrical signal that you get from it. So you've probably seen, either on television or the news or whatever, you see that this can either be printed out on a piece of paper. This when you see this little thing that looks like a tape, a ticker tape coming out of a machine that has the ECG on it, or more likely, it's usually just displayed on an oscilloscope. So you see this little green this little green dot going up and down and making that beep beep noise in the hospital that's the echo uh, sorry that's the electrocardiogram going now notice that the cardiologists have divided the electrocardiogram into several different important places and these different parts of the electrocardiogram represent different parts of the heartbeat okay so this part here p And this part here, QRS, and this part here, T, are important, right? In fact, QRS is the major part of the heartbeat. That's what that's the ventricular systole, right? So we'll learn now what the P, QRS, and T parts of the of the uh, ECG indicate. So here's what you would see normally. The uh, what they're doing here is a called a stress test because the, the heart may be beating normally when you're at rest, but if you start exercising or exerting yourself, they want to check and see that it's still beating normally or whether it starts to beat irregularly if you start exerting yourself. So they have you do a little exercise and then they either, either display on an oscilloscope or they print it out on a piece of paper, print out the ECG wave. All right, so to describe the parts of the ECG wave, the P is where you have atrial systole, so the atria are squeezing the blood into the ventricles. Then the QRS is the ventricular contraction or, or ventricular systole. And then the T part is cardiac diastole, where the heart is relaxing, so we discussed that before. Right, so the P, this is atrial systole. This is ventricular systole, and this is cardiac diastole. So cardiac diastole, that's the, P, the T part. P part is the atrial systole, and then the QRS part is the ventricular systole. And this is just another diagram illustrating the same thing. Once more, the P part is the atrial systole. Then we have these little bits of the little bits of the ECG, which we're not going to worry about. The Q part is the traveling of the signal from the atrioventricular node down to the apex. And then the uh, uh, RST part, or the RS part, is the major contraction of the ventricles. All right, so notice over here, uh, so here we have the PQRS. There's also a U, which is, we're not going to go into that now. Okay, so notice we have a regular heartbeat here. 
That's sometimes referred to as sinus rhythm, sinus rhythm. Here we have a fast heartbeat, so there's tachycardia. Here we have a slow heartbeat, bradycardia. And then notice here we have a cardiac dysrhythmia where the distance between the peaks, the QRS peaks, is not the same. Right? So there's a the gap between the peaks of the of the QRS is variable. So that would be a cardiac dysrhythmia. All right, now a couple of other things we have to learn about. So when the heart is beating normally, that's called normal sinus rhythm. Uh, you have a normal PQRST wave on the ECG. Right, now, the word fibrillation, fibrillation means uncontrollable, uh, kind of an uncontrollable fluttering of a part of the heart. If it's just the atria that's fluttering, you call that atrial fibrillation, which is abbreviated AFib. Uh, that's bad, but you can fix it usually with drugs. On the other hand, if the ventricles are fibrillating, that's very bad. It's abbreviated V-fib, and that usually means you're, heart, you're about to have a heart attack or you're in the process of having a heart attack. V-fib, right? so AFib and V-fib, AFib is bad, V-fib is very bad, but fibrillation in general is bad. Okay, so here's normal sinus rhythm on the left. And here's atrial fibrillation on the right. That's what it looks like. You see all of this jagged stuff in the middle here in between the QRS peaks. This jagged, all these jagged bumps are the atria sort of quivering and shaking. So on the top again, normal sinus rhythm. And then once again, all of this jagged, jagged quivering here is atrial fibrillation. And then this horrible looking ECG wave is V ventricular fibrillation. So what do you do when your heart is fibrillating? When you particularly the uh, ventricular fibrillation, what do you do to get rid of the fibrillation? You, you use a machine called a defibrillator. Defibrillator. And basically you reboot the heart. Right, so what do you do with a computer when it freezes and you don't know anything about computer engineering or anything like that? Um, you turn it off and you turn it back on again and hope that it works when you turn it back on. That's called rebooting the computer. Uh, as much as we like to think we know about the heart, we don't know everything about the heart and we certainly don't know everything there is to know about what caused it to go wrong in the minute, in the minute or so that you've had a heart attack. So the only thing to do in, in such an emergency is to reboot it with a defibrillator. Basically, that's what you're doing. You give, you deliver a massive electrical shock to the heart, um, so that, and then the, hopefully the heart will cont will get back into beating in the normal rhythm. Uh, if it's if it has stopped completely, then you give it a big shock and you hope it starts, and then starts after it starts, you hope it beats in a normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so you probably guarantee you've seen this on television or movies almost every day practically you see where somebody puts these two paddles they they rub an electro gel on these two paddles to make sure that they'll conduct electricity and then they put one on either side of the chest and then they yell clear and then they 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 pull the they pull the little they push the little buttons that are on these two paddles that send an electric shock through the uh, across the chest and through the heart hopefully causing the heart to start again or to stop fibrillating right now why do they ask why do they in the movies why do they always say clear before they before they hit the electricity right clear means they want everybody else who's touching the patient to take their hands away because if you're still touching the patient the electrical shock will go into you as well and that could kill you right so the electrical shock could possibly kill you Right, so what that means is that if you if you're if somebody's having a heart attack, you might be able to restart the heart using a defibrillator. If somebody's actually not having a heart attack, if they're just having a bad attack of indigestion or something like that, and you've used the defibrillator on them, you would you could kill them that way. Right, so that's generally why, up until recently, they never allowed amateurs to use a defibrillator. It had to be a paramedic or a doctor or a nurse or somebody who's been trained how to do the, how to recognize a heart attack versus indigestion or something like that. Okay, now, um, if you ever work in a hospital, you'll hear, or if you've been in a hospital, you'll hear them calling out over the PA system, code blue, code pink, code red, room 205 or something like that. Um, so what those codes mean, code blue means a cardiac arrest. 
And so code pink means a neonatal cardiac arrest. That means there's a baby that's having a heart attack. Code red means there's a fire. And then you can see some of the other codes that you might hear. But co code blue is one of the common things that you'll hear in a hospital. And it means that somebody in a, in a specific room is having a heart attack. So when somebody calls a code blue over the hospital um, uh, intercom, P public PA system, that's probably the only time that you'll hear nurses running down the hall. You'll hear all of these running shoes pattering down the hall, and then you'll hear this ra this racket, this metal metallic cra crashing racket of somebody pushing this thing, which is called a crash cart. It's, it's uh, commonly referred to as a crash cart. And so there, the, all these people are running to the room of the person who's having the heart attack, and right there on the top of the crash cart is the is the defibrillator. So that's what code blue means. They're calling for somebody to bring the crash cart to the room where somebody's having a heart attack. And then in these drawers in the crash cart, you've got epinephrine and all kinds of other drugs that you use to restart a heart or to do other types of emergencies. But that's what code blue means. If you ever hear that called in a hospital, I hope you don't because I don't want anyone to have a heart attack, but that's what that's what that means. Okay, so I just mentioned that if you if if you defibrillate somebody who's not having a heart attack, you might very well give them a heart attack. And so that's why they always used to make it a rule that only doctors and paramedics and other people could use, trained professionals could use a defibrillator. I guess they've changed their minds these days and, and now they believe that it's better to try and have amateurs restart your heart than it is to just let you die. So now you will see things like this in the first aid cupboard. Right, so you see in places, you know, in every Columbia College has one, for instance. Uh, next time you're down in the lobby of Columbia College, you'll see that there's a little symbol on the wall that looks like this heart, uh, this heart symbol with a lightning bolt through the heart. That's telling you where the defibrillator is. Um, and so if somebody has a heart attack, presumably you're allowed to use the defibrillator or the security guard is, is supposed to be trained to use the defibrillator. Uh, but anyway, so now they let they let uh, amateurs have access to defibrillators. Uh, I don't know how that's working out, but I guess it must be okay because they've made that decision. All right, let's move on to pathologies of the heart. Okay, cardiac dysrhythmias, we talked about those. That's where the heart is beating irregularly. Coronary artery disease and valve stenosis, we already talked a little bit about that. Cardiac tamponade and congenital heart defects, which is where you have uh, defects in this case means holes in the heart between the, either the ventricles or the septal defects means hole, a hole in the, in the uh, ventricular septum or the atrial septum. Okay, so ventricular tachycardia, uh, you can fix that with drugs. It just means, you know, the ventricles are constricting too fast. Atrial fibrillation, you can fix that with drugs. Ventricular fibrillation, usually if, if you have sudden ventricular fibrillation, they'll use a defibrillator. A lot of the heart dysrhythmias can be controlled just by having a proper diet. Uh, if you don't get enough potassium in your diet, and a good source of potassium is bananas. I, lo I love bananas, so I, I gladly eat bananas as a way of keeping my heart healthy. Uh, but it, bananas are a good source of potassium. If you have good, if you have a proper amount, proper amounts of uh, potassium will keep the dysrhythmias away. Sorry. So, so sometimes people have cardiac dysrhythmias because they don't have enough potassium in their diet. Okay, so we've seen these different we've seen these different dysrhythmias. The hallmark of of a dysrhythmia is just that the distance between peaks is irregular. All right, so coronary artery disease. This is where the arteries become occluded because they're clogged with plaque. You open it up with a balloon stent. You do balloon angioplasty. Myocardial infarction is where a, a part of the myocardium is killed by a a blood clot clogging one of the one of the coronary arteries. Uh, so what happens is a blood clot that's floating around the blood is referred to as an embolus. If an embolus blocks one of the coronary arteries, it cuts off the flow of blood. That's called ischemia. Right, ischemia. So there is this thing called an ischemic stroke. We talked about that later. That's where uh, an embolus blocks blood flow to the brain. 
So you have ischemia in this case. Uh, ischemia leads to hypoxia, lack of oxygen. The lack of oxygen eventually leads to tissue death. That's called necrosis. And the whole thing, if you have this big chunk of the cardiac muscle, the myocardium that's sitting there dead, that's referred to as a myocardial infarction. Okay, valve stenosis, we already learned about that. That's one of the, if one of the valves becomes stiff and doesn't close, close properly, you may get regurgitation. You can put in an artificial valve. They make valves out of Teflon plastic these days. Or you can, uh, in the old days, they used to, uh, they used to replace the valves with uh, valves from pigs. It's just made of connective tissue. So they, they would take the valve out of a pig and they would put it in your body and you'd live with this pig valve in your chest for a while. Okay, so the word hypertension, by the way, means your blood pressure is too high. Usually means, often means you have an overactive sympathetic nervous system that can be controlled by drugs. Cardiac tamponade, interesting condition. That's where the pericardial sac fills up with fluid, so there's no room for the heart to expand or refill, right? So the pericardial sac might be filling up with blood because there's a blood leakage somewhere, or it might be filled up with fluid because there's a, a leakage of the lymphatic system or something like that. And the symptoms are shortness of breath, feels like you can't breathe, feels like you're having trouble breathing, dip, called dyspnea, right? And the, that's a subjective thing, that's a symptom. The signs are a narrowing pulse, right? So this, what that means is that you, you take the pulse, uh, sorry, a narrowing pulse, you take the blood pressure and, the, and, and you measure the blood pressure and you find that the, the distance between the systole and the diastole is getting smaller and smaller every time. And so the, because the, the heart is having less room to fill up, right? And then the pulse, the pulse uh, uh, beats become closer together. Okay, so here's the pericardium. If the pericardium is filled up with fluid, the heart doesn't have as much room to expand. The only thing you can do is puncture a hole in the pericardium and let the fluid out. And so here's cardiac tamponade again. Okay, so the only thing you can do is to puncture a hole and suck out some of the fluid. In this case, that's called pericardiocentesis, right? So pericardio means around the heart. And then centesis means to pierce with a needle and suck, some, suck the fluid out. Right, so the cardiac tamponade is one of the interesting cardiac pathologies that can occur, and the cure for that is pericardiocentesis. Okay, so the word centesis means to puncture and extract some fluid. All right, now let's look at uh, some of the uh, card. Uh, uh, congenital heart defects, meaning the, wor the word congenital has the word gene in it, right? But it does not mean a genetic condition. It just means a, the word congenital simply means you were born with this condition, but it may or may not have a genetic cause, right? So congenital heart defects, in this case, the only ones that we're going to talk about are holes in the heart that allow blood to move into places where it's not supposed to be. Okay, so if you ha have a hole in the atrial septum, it's referred to as an atrial septal defect, right? This generally allows oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to mix, and that causes problems, right? Because that basically will, it, it will cause you to have less energy. You'll have a lack of energy and shortness of breath. Um, atrial septal defects are not terribly life-threatening, but it, but it does kind of take the wind out of you. Ventricular septal defects is where you have a hole between the two ventricles. So once again, the blood, the oxygenated blood and the oxygen depleted blood mix, which t kind of saps your energy. But more importantly, it, it lowers your blood pressure because if the two chambers, the two ventricles are connected, it's hard to build up pressure to send, to, to send the blood out of the body. So uh, ventricular septal defect is like an atrial septal defect, only much worse. Okay, coarctation of the aorta means that there's a narrowing of the aorta at the, or at the aortic arch. It's kind of pinched into a narrow, narrower diameter. Uh, that does happen sometimes due to genetic reasons like Down syndrome. Right? So people who have Down syndrome sometimes have coarctation of the aorta, so they'll have heart problems. 
All right, so up here we have an atrial septal. Uh, this is a this is an atrial septal defect, allowing the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to mix, which means that the amount of oxygenated blood that's being sent out to the body is lower because we're mixing it constantly with deoxygenated blood. This is a ventricular septal defect. So again, the, the, the blood that's being sent out to the body, the oxygen content is lower, so you feel like you're out of breath all the time. Um, and the pressure is lower because it's hard to build up pressure if there's a, if there's a, a hole that allows the pressure to escape. There's coarctation of the aorta. Right, narrowing of the aorta, which you can fix by cutting by a balloon stent or by cutting that piece out and sewing it, sewing the two other pieces back together, or a resection. Right, so you can you can open up coarctation of the aorta and put in a balloon stent, put in a stent, remove the balloon of course, but put in a stent, or you can cut it out. Okay, now we have some specific words, some specific names that you need to memorize for the different congenital heart defects. Uh, if you have an atrial septal defect that has the hole at the top of the atrium, it's called a sinus venous atrial septal defect. If you have the hole at the side of the atrium near the, uh, near, near, well, basically near the other atria, it's called an ostium primum atrial septal defect. And if it's located at the back of the heart, at the back of the septum on the against the posterior wall. It's called an ostium secundum atrial septal defect. So I may ask you about that on exams. If I do, it will be a multiple choice question. Okay, so here you can see sinus venous, osteo sinus venous, ostium primum, and ostium secundum atrial septal defects. Okay, now there are, if you have an atrial septal defect, uh, it is referred to as, well, let me, do, let me explain where it came from. When you're a baby, when you're a developing fetus in the mother's womb, remember that your lungs are not being used to oxygenate your blood. Your blood is being oxygenated by mother's blood. Right, so mothers, your lungs are not being used, and in fact, they haven't been fully developed. And so there's a there's there is a deliberate, purposeful hole between the two atria, which allows. Uh, there are actually two holes. One of the one of the holes is a connection between the left and the right atria, and the other is a a, a canal that connects the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. Right now, the the hole that connects. The, the hole that connects the left and the right atria is called a foramen ovale, and the, whole, uh, the canal that connects, it's called a fistula, but the, the canal that connects the pulmonary trunk with the aorta is referred to as a ductus arteriosus. It's a duct, basically, right? So it has the word duct in it. Okay, so the foramen ovale that connects the left and right atria and the ductus arteriosus that connects the pulmonary trunk and the aorta are there to allow the blood to bypass the baby's lungs, the developing lungs, right? So the, the blood goes directly from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta and directly from, you know, between from the right atrium to the left atrium. So those two holes are there to bypass the baby's lungs and the, those holes are supposed to close before you're born, right? So if they don't close, then you have a permanent atrial septal defect or a permanent uh, what's known as a patent ductus arteriosus. Okay, so here's the blood supply for a baby. All right, so here we have the placenta. We'll talk about that later, but that's that. the placenta is how the mother is able to oxygenate the baby's blood. The, the, the blood then enters the baby through the, umbilical, through the umbilical cord, right? That's what the navel is for. That's what everyone's belly button is for because we used to have a, we all used to have a hose there that was, that was coming from our mother. Well, it was coming from the placenta basically and delivering, uh, it was delivering oxygenated blood to our system, right? And then the blood comes up here and there is a permanent, or there's a develop, well, as the lungs are developing, there's a hole that connects the left and right atria that's called a foramen ovale. Foramen means hole, ovale means oval shaped hole, right? So the foramen ovale that connects the two atria. And up here, there's a duct that connects the pulmonary trunk with the aorta. And those are supposed to close before you're born. So 
if that foramen ovale does not close, you refer to it as a patent foramen ovale or PFO, patent foramen ovale. Right? Patent foramen ovale it is an atrial septal defect. It's fairly common. About 20% of the population has it, and it's, so, it's mild enough that most people who have it don't even realize they have it. They probably just thought that they, didn't, they, didn't do, they weren't very athletic in school. They couldn't run as fast as the other kids, and they just, they just chalked it up to fate, said, I'll never be a soccer player, but I don't care. Um, and it could have been a, the result of a patent for Raymond O'Vealy. So the word patent is a Latin word meaning open, Right, so, so a patent foramen ovale is a foramen ovale that failed to close before birth. All right, the patent ductus arteriosus is very serious, actually, and you have to fix that with surgery immediately because the blood from the pulmonary trunk is not supposed to be going to the aorta. Uh, that's a very serious condition. Okay, now finally, there's another. So, so we have a patent foramen ovale and we have patent ductus arteriosus. And then finally, there's a, another, another serious heart condition, a congenital heart defect, which is not as bad as patent ductus arteriosus, but it's called Tetralogy of Fallot. There was a doctor named Fallot who they named this after. Tetralogy, I believe it means there are four things that are wrong, but I, I don't know. All right, so what happens here is there are two problems. There are two major problems with a, with a, a Tetralogy of Fallot. One is that you have a ventricular septal defect, right? So you have the low blood pressure, poor, poor oxygenation of the blood, and you also have a reduction in the diameter of the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is the large artery, the pulmonary artery basically, that takes the blood away from the heart and sends it to the lungs. So that means the, lung, the, 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 the oxygen depleted blood has a hard time getting to the lungs because the pulmonary trunk is very narrow. And then in addition to that, if that wasn't bad enough, in addition to that, there's a hole between the left and the right atrium. So the oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood is mixing. And so the baby is having trouble getting enough oxygen. And when the baby is born, it has a bit of a blue color because the, ox the, the blood is not properly oxygenated. Right, so there are two blue baby syndromes that we're going to learn about in this course. The first one is Tetralogy of Fallot, and this is what causes the baby to be born with a blue color. The other, ba the other blue baby syndrome that we're going to talk about is related to the immune system, and so we're going to talk about that when we get to the, to the lymphatic system. Okay, so for now, Tetralogy of Fallot is one of two blue baby syndromes that we're going to learn about in this course, and it's caused by poor oxygenation of the blood due to constriction of the pulmonary trunk and combined with a ventricular septal defect. All right, so per patent foramen ovale, patent ductus arteriosus. You can see the connection between the, the aorta and the, the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary artery. And here's Tetralogy of Fallot, right? So we have a ventricular septal defect down here, plus a constriction of the pulmonary trunk. There's a blockage. All right, so to summarize this long introduction to the heart, we talked about the chambers of the heart and the great vessels. We talked about how to calculate cardiac output and cardiac reserve. We learned about the meaning of the various parts of the ECG. We learned how to measure blood pressure. We're going to learn about it again when we do the when we do the vascular section of the course next. We learned about some pathologies of the heart, including cardiac tamponade, cardiac artery disease. We learned how to do a, a balloon stent to open up an occluded artery. And we learned the names of some, of some septal defects, uh, some congenital uh, heart defects, patent, uh, patent foramen ovale and patent ductus arteriosus and tetralogy of Fallot. All right, so the next lecture uh, cardiovascular system part two will be learning about the important blood vessels in the cardiovascular system.